She got her first casting opportunity in September 2016 for a Clash Royale tournament in Toronto, Canada, which then led her to several other work opportunities in esports, eventually pulling her away from her day job to become a streamer and esports professional full time. BBXH now commands an audience of over 140,000 followers on Twitch and across other channels. I will now bring BBXH onto the stage and have her introduce the other panelists. Hello. Can you all, all hear right. me? Welcome. Welcome, BBXH. Hi. How is it going? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm so pumped. All right. Well, I'll let you do what you do best. So okay. I'll take take off the stage. Okay. Thanks, Christian. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you today. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. As he said, I'm BBXH, so it's nice to meet you. And I'm usually on the other side of things, so this is really nice that I get to be the moderator today. I get to ask the questions today. So I have uh, three speakers on my panel today. I want to introduce each of them, starting with my friend Azuki. Uh, whose real name is Nikki, because you have to establish that in the content creator world. Everyone calls each other by their streaming name. So Azuki, she is very accomplished. She has directed a multi-award winning documentary, Fight Like a Girl. She started an all-women's esports team. Uh, she's done various work all over the film industry, and she's now a full-time Twitch streamer, which she has been streaming on and off in intertwined with her film work for four years and uh she is a pomeranian mom like me mine's over here but she has three of them who she sent me a video this morning that they have been <laughs> there's one <laughs> they were all at her feet needing her attention my next speaker right over here is alex so he is the owner of the madrina's coffee company which i just had a cup this morning they, i have to shout it out because they just released coffee beans today and I had my first cup. It was real good. Uh, but before he ever became an influencer, he was a competitive Halo player. So needless to say, he's very good at gaming. And on top of running his coffee business, he's also a full-time streamer for two years now. And he's recently married. So that's exciting for him. So we'll definitely get into it with him with how to balance work life, streaming life, personal life, because he obviously has that mastered. My last guest is Paulo. Uh, Pereira, he's a coordinator of operations for online marketplace for Smile One. This company develops partnerships with content creators. He previously worked at Riot Games, which all of us know, I believe, in the behaviors department, uh, giving him loads of experience working with influencers like these two. So good to have you all here today. Welcome. So I want to start off uh, with some basics. I want to start off with Azuki. If you could tell us how and why did you get into streaming on Twitch? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, streaming for me, it started in like 2013 kind of thing. Um, I went to BlizzCon and I, uh, I, I met a lot of amazing people and it sort of just kind of like snowballed from there. And I really wanted to create content for not only like my friends, but to like empower other females. And so it kind of just took off from there. The idea of streaming for me. Very cool. Alex. Same question to you. How and why did you start streaming? Uh, I say my mic's working, correct? Oh, yeah. Okay, awesome. I was worried that the, that the tech side wasn't going <laughs> to work for me, but we're working. Um, I got into streaming because we we made this incredible coffee company, and uh, we found such a, such a rewarding and redeeming audience and community online in the Twitch world and in the live stream world. Um, so I just started going live in the morning because it's a coffee company. And when else are you drinking coffee but in the morning, getting hype and, and getting live and, and getting about your day? So uh, pairing community and content with coffee uh, was the natural um, the, na the natural find for me to be live uh, early, early. Very cool. And I definitely want to get into that with how you've kind of intertwined the two. Before we do... Uh, welcome to Paulo. Paulo, can you tell uh, us how you started working on the marketing end of gaming? Yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, sorry for the for the video. I think I had a problem with my webcam. I will try to solve it later. But yeah, so yeah. I started I started working at, at the video game company when I was like 22. It was at Riot. Riot just moved to Brazil for like three months, and I used to play League of Legends a lot, like a bloody place. League of Legends since the, 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 the beta, 
probably 2010, and then right into Brazil 2012, end of 2012. And I got in, and then I started working in the Riot and the player support department. So first I was like working uh, with answer people's tickets and questions and everything. And while I was there, uh, well, Riot was actually growing a lot. So they, they made this department called the behavior department. So we are, uh, responsibility was to like see how our players were behaving in the game and try to improve you know, like toxic behavior or try to make people have like more like good behavior and positive behavior and try to like be cool with the players and not yell at someone just because they made a mistake or something like that. And that's my beginning. Like I worked, worked with that for like five years and then I left Raya, went to Canada actually. I went to Canada, stayed one year in Canada. And then I come back to Brazil and started working in this as my one and the marketing department and with content creator and everything. Very cool. So back yes. to Azuki. Obviously, you've done so much work, and I'm sure it's helped you on both sides of it with working in the film world and then also with content creation. So how you created your documentary, Fight Like a Girl, which I, of course, have seen uh, when you released it, which is really exciting. And it deals a lot. I mean, going back to kind of what Paulo said, I mean, there, a behavior is a big part of it. And I know as women or even just people in general, would we're dealing with different behavior. And so I feel like you did a really good job of shedding light on what it's like to be a woman in the gaming industry. So for you as a woman yourself in the gaming industry and you're very accomplished, how has the content creation helped inspire you to kind of open those doors or to create that documentary about that topic? Yeah, so it all started back when I when I went to BlizzCon. I know I keep circling back to that, but um. It, I was sitting in the crowd and I was watching a, a bunch of teams like Cloud9 and all these other amazing teams like competing against each other. And then I realized something. I'm like, oh my goodness, there's not one single female that's competing right now. And I noticed this for years and years. And that year I said, you know what, I'm going to go home and I'm going to do something about this. So when I got home, I went ahead and I, and I posted in this really like large Blizzard uh, gaming chat. And I asked, would any any ladies be interested in being a part of like a team or something? And that's sort of kind of like how everything fell through. It fell in. Um, and from there, I started to meet amazing, amazing women who compete in all sorts of games. And that's how Fight Like a Girl was born. It was born from the idea of like, hey, there's more, there's women who are competing. It's just a numbers game at the end of the day. And um, it inspired so many people to create and, and, and feel fearless and compete more. And that's why I think you're starting to see a little bit more of women now in the competitive scene as well as the streaming scene. I love that. I definitely have, I ran into the same thing as Christian mentioned in the intro. I used to host and uh, do a lot of esports tournament work. And uh, it was just, uh, yeah, I don't, I never saw a woman competing. And I always wonder why, like we need more women out here. And I'm slowly starting to see that, like you said. So it makes me really happy. And I'm really glad that you're, drawing more women into it, making a safe space for them. So Alex, <laughs> let's talk about you. And so you are doing something different in the fact that you're running a business and al you're also creating content. You've definitely meshed the two together. So how has content creation affected your com coffee company, Madrinas? Um, everything, that, everything that I do in my life and everything that we've done at Madrinas has always been, I was saying this word earlier, but so it might sound buzzwordy after I say it a lot, but it's all about community. <laughs> yeah. And um, if you had a coffee company in, I don't know, uh, the 1960s or the 1970s, there wasn't a lot of ways to build community. There was a lot of, uh, you know, just traditional commercialization through retail or, or, you know, standard business models. But it's 2021, so we get to do things a lot differently, fortunately, as a business world as a content you know world from a creator perspective as you guys know uh everything's just done differently now and you can do so many things direct and uh what that means for us is we get to create a direct relationship with everybody that wants to uh interact with madrinas uh anybody that wants to buy our coffee anybody that wants to check it out any, anybody that wants to love it and get caffeinated every morning with with madrinas we get to build that direct relationship and there's so 
many barriers that have been um, that have been uh, stripped down and so many bridges that have been built uh, in in way of, of paths for that relationship that live content is just one of them. You know, live content is just one of the many ways that if someone wants to interact with Madrinas, they can come and they can talk with, you know, someone that's behind it. Uh, and it's just viewing, it's viewing community first. Um, like I said, that's going to sound buzzwordy if I say a lot, but it's just, it's just viewing the relationship side of what we're doing first, uh, versus saying, Hey, we have a web store and we sell coffee. I, I hope people, you know, come and check us out. I hope they love it. It's more about let's be proactive and let's develop relationships with the people that are going to make up, you know, the Madrina's coffee community, the people that love our coffee, the, the people that, that keep us in business. Let's, let's develop a relationship with them. And, yeah. uh, we've been thinking like that. And that's what's led me to live content uh, in the mornings. And, you know, we have a lot of different platforms, a lot of different ways that we sell coffee, a lot of different ways that we bring coffee to market. Um, all of them, though, kind of center back to the direct to consumer idea and and developing that relationship direct with the, the, the person that's um, that's that's drinking our coffee. If, if I could hand the bag to everybody, I would, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. if I could as direct as it can be. And, and, and strip out the middlemen, you know, like, yeah. it, but unfortunately I, I, you can't download our copy. So we need like UPS and we need like yep. all the freight and logistics companies and Amazon's a big deal. So Amazon's a, a, a partner of ours as well. So it's like, it, but I mean, eventually, like literally if I could hand everybody a cold brew, that's how direct to consumer we want to make the experience with Madrinas. So, um, yep. It's just about building those bridges and live content was really natural live content it's really authentic and it's really it's really it, it's very sincere oh yeah uh, you know versus like a like a like a, a vod based platform um li a live based platform is i mean you can't you can't lie about who you are i mean you're live right so people get the chance to meet the real you and read for for us it's it's kind of like a chance to, to ask questions about the brand and about madrinas but then even more than that like the lives the lives of the people that are behind Madrinas, you know, like the, the Madrinas team will come and hang out in chat in the morning and everybody loves them and they get to know them a little bit more and about Sarah and her dogs and, you know, everybody <laughs> and, you know, Austin and his love for baseball. It's just like everybody gets to meet the team a little bit more and it's about pulling that veil back a little bit and building bridges. Yeah. I saw Austin in my chat this morning, actually. So that's funny that you say that. And going back to Alex's point, so you've definitely built, I feel like, such a strong bonded community. I mean, you go into like your channel and everybody does this thing called face yelling. Yeah. So basically, if I go into Alex's Twitch stream and I say, good morning, everybody, everyone starts in all caps writing D or BBX stage, good morning. And then you just you face yell back to everybody. And it's just such a welcoming. I don't know. Thing. It's about hype. It's about created. waking up. It's yeah. about getting going. It's about not just like getting out of bed and dragging your feet into your day, but like jumping out of bed and being excited and knowing that, you know, all you got to do is just log into Twitch and you have a bunch of people there waiting mm -hmm. for you uh, to say hi and, and be there with you, whether or not you're working or whatever you're doing throughout the day. Even, about, sometimes when you're not even live, I go into your <laughs> chat and I see people talking and you're not yeah. even streaming, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's just everyone's getting caffeinated and yeah. starting your day and being excited together. Absolutely. And I feel like that's such a big thing with content creation is you have to you've built a safe space for people where, you know, they come in and they feel excited to be there. They say excited to say good morning and they feel people are excited to see them. You know, what makes right. you feel better than somebody screaming your name to <laughs> say good morning. Right. So. Exactly. All right. Let's talk to Paulo. So, Paulo, in your opinion, what makes an influencer a good fit for a marketing campaign? Okay, so like right now we have like some guidelines, but one thing that is always good to consider is that the market is still new. So like in the beginning, like let's assume like five, six years ago, for you to be like an influencer and able to have like a, a good deal or contract with big companies, you need to have like guidelines like TV guidelines. Because like we didn't really know like how to, to, to live stream stuff or like how to to make policies on top of that, like how, because if like, influencers, like the name say, you guys influence stuff. So you guys influence people. So like your opinion, the way you talk, the way you you see the world change people. And like before that, like companies didn't have that, that kind of awareness. But I think right now the market is growing a lot and 
more and more and more like the companies are starting using like those content creation, like both small ones and big ones. So the guidelines are always changing and always evolving, evolving because of that. But like I can say, like basically, usually we look for like the a good like match for the product. So like we have like a product specific product. So we will find someone who use that product and like the product. More than use that people who like the product, we always go for like someone who have like a passion for the game or for the other product that we are trying to market it. Uh, numbers always good. Like see if you said you had a lot of views, a lot of subscribers. Like how the social media goes. And another important thing too is like how he treats his fans, like or how he treats mm. his, his his community. Like if he's a good guy, or like if he swears a lot, or if he doesn't, doesn't care. Like you, you can see, like if you watch like 10, 20 videos of someone, you can kind of see if he really likes what he's doing, or he's just doing for the money, or he's like whatever. And especially like if you close like a, a big like six month contract, we need someone who's going to represent our, our brand. So we need someone who's gonna like at least be polite and try to respect everyone. So that's something that we're always looking at, for sure. And now, if let's say for me, let's say I'm a new influencer, I'm a new streamer. I how do I find these kind of campaigns? How do I get linked up with different marketing campaigns for products or for games? It usually like how we do our company, we actually we look for it, like we go after it. So like we have a new product or you want to make a marketing company for this product. So we go looking for like content creators and influencers from that product and see the videos and try to look at it. We actually right now use like some kind of like uh like big agencies, like there's mm -hmm. one called Linky Me. So this one that they they hire a lot of influencers, but they have a lot of influencers under your umbrella. And then we call them and say, yeah, we have this product. We want to do a marketing company. You have someone who is a match for us. So like, I think like uh, linking me, we use that too as well. Sometimes like if you want to do like a big one, like someone who's, who's big, probably go for linking me because it's more professional than just like sending an email on YouTube or something. Uh, but like if you are an influencer and a content creator, you should look for those kinds of agencies. Like Linky Me or like Sparks, Sparks Teams, that is, is another one that's going to be big too, right? Like that's the whole idea of this community is to help each other on, on this kind of aspect. But that that's not just for game as well. Like you can go for like another kind of products because like in our company we sell like Tinder uh, and other kinds of like digital products like Netflix or Uber or something. So sometimes you look for influencers who are not gamers, like specifically. So that that's another thing too. Like. Interesting. Okay, well, that's very insightful, especially for newer streamers who are looking how to get started with those campaigns. Let's jump back to Azuki. Azuki, do you envision yourself streaming full time, long term, or where do you see the future of content creation in general headed, in general, or for yourself? Well, I think that um, content creation is always evolving. So mm -hmm. take a look at TikTok now, those type of videos, like quick, you know, gaming clips and stuff like that. So I personally think I'll always stay a content creator and a director. Um, I, I see myself as directing more documentary type films in the future um, and some other various like film jobs, of course. Uh, streaming. It's always going to be a part of my daily diet, basically. <laughs> I think I can't yeah. really give that up because I feel like we have built such a family on, yeah. on the streaming platforms and, and plus all the opportunities that come from, uh, you know, getting to know other streamers or events that happen. Um, I think it's a great way to stay connected with the Internet as yeah. well. So for me, I, I think it's something that's going to be kind of like for, for the rest of my life, but it's going to be evolving and, and changing shapes as it goes on. Yeah. Um, and you obviously, you and I know each other very well. So I know that you took a break for quite some time from streaming and then you came back into it. What was it like for you to start it back up again after taking a break? You know, it was really interesting because I decided to take more time for film work. And what was mm -hmm. I, what I was doing is working on set 12 hour plus days every day. And it kind of gets to you after a while. You're like, especially if you're not doing kind of like above the line, which means uh, directing or or anything that like is in the creative department. So for me, uh, taking a step back into streaming, it was kind of I was a little worried at first. I'm like, OK, I 
haven't streamed in a year and a half. I don't know how this is going to go. But like I said, it evolved so much over time that all of a sudden it's like a whole new crowd of people and, mm -hmm. and all the support is different. And all of a sudden I'm getting partnered. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, these things that I didn't imagine would happen two to three years back. And now it does. So... That's super cool. Yeah, it's been it's such an interesting world of it. And you just I mean, it's so unknown to take a break or like myself, I've switched games, which is has a dramatic effect on you know, who shows up and all of that. And obviously, you and we all play Sea of Thieves now. And it's I, I do really enjoy that community. And it's been a welcoming one. So yeah. So Alex, kind of on that topic. Um, so you've been creating content for to, coming up on two years and you've obviously have a massive following and people that like stay with you like we talked about before and they you know we have all these other things outside of streaming going on with your community um so what advice would you give to somebody who's already creating content but they're struggling to grow oh man okay so someone that's wanting to grow in the content world mm -hmm. um <clears throat> i would say it's really important to find ways to connect with your um with your audience outside of just being live and the content world's big so it's like you could be creating content for a vod style platform like youtube or you could be creating um you know funny shorts for instagram or TikTok, or you could be live on twitch or on facebook whatever uh so there's lots of different ways to do it um but it's important to to interact with your audience in a lot of diverse ways and i say audience but i to me it's just more like I've always viewed the people that are hanging out, especially with me live in the morning. I've never liked to use the term like my community or my audience. I always just say these are my friends. Like everyone's here just hanging out with me because that's how it feels to me. It doesn't feel like like every time I hear someone say, oh, it's like my community. I, the way I view that is like, OK, that's cool. But the way I view what I do from a content perspective is build a group of friends like and everybody can hang out and be with each other. I don't ever feel like ownership or, or autonomy over anything that's going on. It's a bunch of awesome people that are coming together to hang out and find each other. So um, it's, it's if you th for me, when I think about it like that, it comes down to how can you foster a really awesome group of friends? Like how can, how, like what are the things, like imagine if you had all these people that you got to hang out with in real life, what would you wanna do? Like how often would you wanna see them? Like, you know what I mean? Would, would you want everybody to just be, you know, be watching you do stuff or do you wanna uh, interact with people in a lot of different ways, you know? So it's, it comes down to just, uh, it comes down to, for me, at least the perspective on it and um, and creating a space for people to come and just be friends and be friends with other people. And like you mentioned that word, a safe space where they can come and, um, you know, be themselves. And it's a it, it's it feels inclusive. Um, for me, it just comes down to fostering that friendship. Um, and it's not even just between you and the people there. It's between the people and the people there, too. So it's like getting away for everybody to to feel to feel comfortable with one another. And I think that transcends like platform strategy or analytics. To me, that's like the soft side. That's like the human side of of what like you do in the morning or what, you know, anybody that's, you know, anybody that's streaming like Nikki or whatever, anybody that's making content. I think that's like the yeah. soft side. Like those, those are the soft metrics. And it's hard to put a an, a, an objective sort of um, like measurement on that. It's hard to capture any of that in in any sort of analytic. You, you can watch that stuff on the back end. And if people get hung up on growth because they're there's not seeing a concurrency number that they want or a subscriber number that they want or a view number that they want or follow like you can get caught up in that but it's so much more fun and so much more um worth it if everybody just stays focused on the quality of time that everybody's spending with one another you know because if everybody's having a good time then more people are going to want to come and have a good time with you and more people are going to want to be included and, and and make those friends you know it's 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 the softer side that I that I view, you know, versus the yeah. the 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 harder objective side. So um, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I, definitely. I rambled. And now, so for for those people who are hearing that advice, they're saying, okay, that's great. Now, what can I do? What are some examples of things? I know some, but I'll let you answer. Of course, the things that you have done outside of the streaming. Uh, you know, going live and having the chat, talking with them on your stream. What are some of those things that you have done to kind of build that relationship with your crew outside of the stream? Is that for me? Yeah. So 
I mean, a, a small local example to this week is, uh, I mean, you know, this game that came out, um, this New World game that came out that we've been playing. And to me, it's such a cool opportunity to uh, invite everybody to come spend time with one another in this virtual space. And, you know, it's been hard because of the pandemic. Normally, you know, if you're, you know, if you're able to schedule meetups or see people at, you know, TwitchCon or whatever, um, like it's easier to kind of build more of those face-to-face -face human interactions, but you got to find ways to incentivize interactions with one another virtually. And this, I mean, it's top of mind for me, so I'm going to bring it up again, but like this new world experience where everybody gets to play together, you know, <laughs> and it's it's kind of like, oh, we're going to, we're going to, organize times together and we're going to see each other in the space and um it's it's just about it's just about encouraging interaction with everybody um yep. and and so for this week i mean it's a really fun opportunity i mean we're running around in this new game uh and seeing everybody like just you streamed about 14 hours yesterday 14 hours from so addicted to running around and like just with every i mean there's so many yeah. friends like in the space and so it's like everybody it's the it's the it's the craziest thing, and I was telling Mel this the other night. I was just like, man, the like everybody's playing together and interacting with one another, and it feels so it feels so um, uh, like engaging, and it feels so uh, rewarding on like the social side. Uh, Mel is my wife for anybody that doesn't know. Uh, I was telling her this the other night, and uh, and you know it, you, I was just explaining this to her, but then she played last night, and then she was running into all our friends, and then she was like, wow, I see what you mean. Like it's really rewarding. So it's like finding those opportunities to encourage engagement with everybody is you know one of those you know kind of like uh principles of community that that are important for people to feel like oh this is worth my time yeah well on that topic paulo so i think obviously as he's talking about doing kind of extracurriculars or things outside of going live to kind of grow your stream but on so you have this knowledge of the other side of it with the game so how do you feel game selection as in what game i choose to go live with can affect someone's content creation like what how do i choose a game if i say okay i want to be a streamer what game do i do what advice do you have for game choice okay we actually you can go both ways right like if you are a big streamer you can influence the game like Asmongold. you guys, mm -hmm. you guys like saw Asmongold with final fantasy 14 in the world of Warcraft, that was huge. And like, he was one person and decided to move to another game. And then like a whole player base, like 200,000 people follow him to this another game. And but, but from the side of like, if you are new, if you don't have like this big of a community, you can always look for like new releases. And especially like new releases in, in, the, in, in your country specifically, because like there is, you can look for new releases like in USA or Europe or, or Asia, and there's difference between which games they play there and which games they play here. So looking for new releases in your in the region you're working, this is like the first thing you should do. Like if you if you want to go on this like gamer path. Uh, aside from that, it's like if you like the game as well. It's not just like oh it's a new game, everyone's talking about it. Let let me play it. Like if you don't like the game, if you don't have like the passion for it, I don't think you're gonna. I don't think your community is gonna like watch you play because like usually when we watch someone's play because like he plays like with like passion and happiness and like he's doing what we can do that time. So that's why we're watching him. And so that's very important to do something you like, like join a game you like or something like that. And aside from that, like for sure, like what what he said about like the soft side of like content creation like you can always go like to the numbers and and like see how these guys have like one million or two hundred million but sometimes he's small now but like he's such a good guy with this community like he has so much passion with like people who watch him and he's always talking that like you know like maybe he doesn't have like a huge reach right now but like people who watch him like him and like whatever he say to these people they're gonna like probably follow so like more than just numbers, he had like a very loyal from days. And that's very important as well. Yes. Now, a game, let's say you obviously coming from Riot and you are into League of Legends. I feel that obviously there are large streamers and they pull in big viewership. Do you feel like that's maybe too much of a saturated market to begin streaming in? Yeah, you, you can take that relevation for sure, but like again, like if you're just beginning right now, like in the 
documentation creation side. Like you're gonna start small, so like it's preferable mm -hmm. to you to start something you like because like you're gonna have to do that every day. Because I think like more that I saw when I'm doing my research, like in small game, game creations, is that like they don't keep going. Like they start, they have like a dream that they want to, to start like making money with game, uh, uh, being an influencer with the internet or something. But then they like in the first year they don't have like a huge a lot of followers or something and they stop. And mm -hmm. but actually they, they make like good content, but like they need some more time to like people see and talk about it. Like sometimes it explodes, but sometimes it takes time. And like I have a lot of like good examples of people that like was in my radar like one year ago and they keep going and they keep like doing content, good content. And they like one year after they're like big enough for us to like talk to them. So like, if you want to really do that, like keep doing because like, I don't think growth is like, uh, especially like right now, it's, there's a, 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 a formula. I think to like, it's sometimes just happened. There's a lot of luck, a lot of like timing, a lot of network that happened as well. So for sure, <laughs> yeah, I think that. Great, well, thank you. I feel like that'll, hopefully shed some insight for newer content creators or people that are struggling and maybe it's game choice. And so I think the new releases, especially Alex was talking about new world, maybe it's a good option to be brand new. So thank you all for answering my questions. I want to jump over. Now we have a few questions for you guys. Um, so let's segue over to there now, and then I'll just kind of let you guys, if you feel like you have a good answer, then, you know, feel free to jump in to answer the question. Um, let's see, where should we start? Okay, Christian asked the question, where do you get your inspiration for new content? How do you keep yourself inspired? Maybe Alex or Azuki, do you have oh. maybe an idea <laughs> okay. for that one? Um, yeah, whenever I see like something new come out, I like to just, um, I like to do first playthroughs and kind of have like a reaction to it and, and see how that goes. And normally, um, like I was playing, let's say Outlast, and people really loved watching me play for the first time. So I think like that kind of first playthrough kind of thing works very well. A lot of people like to see that. Um, inspiration for new content. Uh, where do where do I get it from? Um, I, inspiration for styles of new content. I, I mean, I stay I stay pretty hungry on socials as far as um, an appetite for what's working in the world, trends and everything. So I. I mean, there's most of the most of the social feeds, most of the social platforms. I, I stay kind of voraciously, you know, devouring what what other people are doing and trying to see what works and what's out there and working. But like, uh, as far as like emotional inspiration, um, I just you know, I, I it, it's it's not about um, for me. It's not about like the content itself. It's more about uh, the time that I get to put in uh, and and the rewarding nature of of the of the human interaction. So it's like. For me, I'm always inspired by by hitting the go live button and and like you were talking about the face yells and everything and just like <laughs> seeing everybody. Like I'm such an I'm such an emotional extrovert first person that I need that like real feedback in my life. So as far as like actual emotional inspiration, I get it from going live. Like there might be there might be days where, you know, I, I'm I'm up late or there's a lot going on like I'm working with the Madrina's team and there's and there's just some critical things that we're working on and I might get a little tired, but I know that the second I hit go live, it's all gonna be um it's all gonna be as rewarding as it ever is because it's just I get to see everybody again. So that's where like the emotional inspiration comes from. Inspiration for styles of content. I just stay devouring everything on the internet, you know. I try to see what's working and what people are liking. Yeah. Um here's the next question from David. Maybe this one, Paulo, you could answer. How important is the balance between quality versus quant quantity? I think it's very important. That's what I'm saying about like people who really like what they're doing and people who are just like doing for their money or because of, of it. So like when, especially like when we, uh, when I'm doing the headhunter for like a new a new product, I'm always going to look for for quality. Like there's always like the quantity like. Uh, problem because like I'm not gonna like hire you if you have like one viewer and one subscriber in your channel like you need something at least but way more than that like I can look for your product like if you, if you have like a good quality content 
for sure that helps way more than the numbers sometimes. Um, David also has a question directed towards Alex. Um, I guess this is back when we were talking about um, about your company and David asked, are you talking about fulfilling a need as opposed to providing a product, I guess with Matrinas and streaming? Um, it, on a philosophical level, like on a like on a business strategy level, is that what is, he, is that what he's asking? I'm not sure. Are you talking about fulfilling as a need as opposed to providing a product? I think just uh, yeah. Maybe. Okay, I think I know what he's saying. I think it's okay. more like the, the the philosophy of entrepreneurship and uh, how you view it. Um, yeah, fulfilling a need is a uh, is is um is important uh, on the business side because versus just providing a product. Because anybody can provide a product, right? I mean, anybody can do anything um, in this world. You can get anything made and you can take it to market. But it's it's about identifying the need in the market um, in order for you to actually be able to project a business that uh, can develop into like a going concern. Um, at the end of the day, I'm always a believer that um, that like the Adam Smith invisible hand uh, just takes takes uh, uh, takes um, control of everything like um you don't got to worry uh, too much if your product does or doesn't uh, work in the market. The market will tell you if you um, aren't selling stuff or if your promotions aren't working or if your strategy is off. The market tells you, you know, and you just got to pay attention to that sort of Adam Smith nature. Um, but as far as fulfilling a need, that gets a little bit more into the psychology of, uh, of a niche that you're targeting versus just uh targeting a niche so it's like getting into the how they think um and when i say they i'm i have like my marketing like my my entrepreneurship hat on right now and i'm and when i think about madrinas and how we grow it and how we identify our our target market it's it's knowing how they think knowing how they process knowing what your market um how it reacts uh to certain things and that's once you once you're able to kind of have that empathetic approach for me, it's easy because I'm a part of the, you know, the gaming industry, gaming community at large. And I have been since I was like, you know, um, like 13 years old, uh, you know, traveling and going to Halo tournaments. But like, um, but yeah, fulfilling that need, I think, is important. Again, this is the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial hat on, not the content creator hat on. But it's, it's more about um, knowing that what you're bringing to market is adding real value. And if you do that, it's sustainable for your business um, and that's what you need to find if you want a uh, if you want a business that can develop into a growing concern if you're if you're if you're harvesting and uh, if you're developing a startup. Okay. Uh, next question. I will leave this open. I think any any three of you could answer it. How can somebody work in this industry if they are not a professional gamer? Can this industry provide full time roles? Absolutely. There's so many companies out there like Razor that are always opening up opportunities. Um, so many different like companies for microphones, for <laughs> headsets, keyboards, you know, Corsair. Um, I don't know. I can name so many. You can go and look at the opportunities that they have on their websites. You can you can work as PR for them. You can get involved with like community events. There's just endless possibilities to work in the gaming industry without having to be a gamer yourself or a professional mm -hmm. gamer in general. I, th I think right. like being a gamer is like kind of necessary, like being a professional gamer, not for, for sure not, but like being a gamer too, like, because like usually like I work like three different game companies and one thing they always look for is like if you are a gamer, like if you used to work like real like video games, because that's what you're like you're working with. Like being a gamer is like for sure like a positive, but like be, being a professional gamer not so much. Like in like uh, as we said, like you can work in so many different areas. Like at Riot, I used to work in the psychology department with like player behavior. So like with pure psychology and pure numbers, there is nothing to do with games. It's just like the people who are playing the game. So there is tons of different opportunities for sure. Yeah, I want to go off what Paolo just said. The the like. I mean, the stock answer that you'll hear is, oh, there's a lot of companies that have community management and you can reach out and whatever. And like, that's like, I feel like that's obvious, but the, um, going off of what Paolo just said, like, there's so much, like, like, like the, if someone wants to get involved in the gaming industry, it is a fully self-sufficient and self-sustaining ecosystem that has every element of any other industry inside of it. So it's like, 
you don't just got to be making content and you don't just got to be a video editor or something like that. You, if you're, if you think creatively enough, you'll find a way in like, um, it's got to be a good pairing of the, of the community that you want to be a part of, which it sounds like if you're already at this stage of the process, you want to be a part of the gaming community. And then the other thing is like, what do you love to do? What do you, what do you love to occupy your time with? And you most likely will be able to marry those two things together. You just kind of like got to get creative and find the ways in uh, a lot of them aren't going to be obvious. Like there's mo most of the ways to um, to like get involved in the gaming community, like in a really rewarding and fulfilling way, aren't going to be like super obvious, like a posting, you know, on link, like someone's like reaching out on LinkedIn and they're saying, hey, this is the exact job I need. And it just so happens that it's, be it's your dream job. You kind of like have to create that vision for yourself and then draw, like find the path there. Um, but it, you can, you can like trust that it's a fully self-sufficient ecosystem where it supports a lot of different roles and a lot of different jobs and a lot of different uh, capacities for people. And you can you can get your way there. You just got to like, obviously be, be willing to put the time and energy in, but you also have to have that vision of being like, this is what I want to be doing in this space. And here's how I get there. Um, it's a little bit more of a, I feel like that's actually, I, I turned it into a cop out because it's kind of like, you're going to have to you know do that creativity on your end. But that's kind of like what it is. You got to like see it. No one else is going to see it for you. And you got to like write that path. Yeah. All right. We've, I'll jump to the next question. I think we maybe have time for one more. Uh, and I think this is a good one for you guys. I'm going to combine, I think, two questions. Binger and Alan both asked a question kind of similar. So Alan asked about basically how do you have a life balance between, you know, a lot of people are working full time. They have a family uh, other obligations, they have their friends and then they're gaming. And then kind of on top of that, Binger asked, how do you know when the decision is to go full time with streaming? So Anyone was the first to... part was the first part work life? Yeah. balance? Yes, let's go with that one first. Well, how do you balance all of that? Especially that's a good one for you, Alex, because you're also running a company on top of full time streaming. I actually again, I was talking to Mel about that last night. I was like, you know, you, if you if you have a plan for your day that puts you at 120 percent capacity, you don't have, you know, there's not 28 or 30 hours in a day. You only have 24 hours. So you have to decide. You have to first and foremost. For me, it starts in my life. This is just what has worked for me. Is like I have like a personal value statement that's important to me, and I work backwards from there. And um, and like I start with that statement with everything I do in my life, everything that I'm. That every ounce of energy that I pour into anything, if it doesn't ladder back to what my values are personally, then it's not worth my time. Um, so then, it, then from there, it's just time management and it's discipline. And uh, some, especially being live, some days it's harder than others um, it, to balance it all. Uh, but discipline first and foremost. But for me, the the I feel like the where I can add value to this to this is is that is that personal value statement. Like I know the values that I have in my life. Like. I'm not lost or confused on what's important to me and what brings me true happiness and true joy. Like it's for me, it's like my family, my friends and, and, uh, and the, and working as hard as I possibly can. And if everything comes back to those things, um, then I, then I know that I can invest my time in it. And then it's a matter of, then it's a matter of, you know, viewing your day and understanding your schedule and, and finding that sustainable routine. Nikki, do you want to maybe answer the question of how do you know when it's time to go full time streaming? Sure. Um, for me, it, you have to figure out, like Alex was saying, it's like a balance and what's like, you know, what's good for you. So, for example, the me going full time, that means that I dedicate five days a week at least and an X amount of hours. Um, if I'm exceeding those hours, you, you know, usually that cuts into my own personal time. And that could affect uh, dinner, workout, hanging out with friends or family. So you got to figure out like a nice balance with that. Um, but for me, I feel like if you if you just pick like a nice like four or five hours, five days a week, and then and then you know that you're giving the appropriate times to your pets, your your husband, wife. You know, like I feel like that would be a great balance, especially if you're going full time. Let's do one more question. I'm going to squeeze in one more before the next panel because I think this is such a good one. And maybe, Paulo, you can start since you worked in the behavioral department of how do you deal with toxic people in your chat when you're a streamer or just in general in gaming? 
Okay, like just mute. <laughs> like that's the best thing you can do. <laughs> that's what I <laughs> say. Yeah, yeah, that, like that, that's for sure. Like we used to do that at like at, at Riot, like we do like a lot of research and everything. Because like most of the times, the person who is toxic, he's not a toxic person. He has been a toxic behavior. Like he's kind of mad or something. He's not having a good day or like he's not a toxic person. He's had a toxic behavior. So like you trying to like talk to him, trying to show him like good ways in the middle like, of a match or in the live chat or something, probably is not going to work. Probably is going to make him talk back with you and like the experience is going to be like no, no point. So like mute the person. Like from the company side, like usually you, you want to like punish bad behavior and like more than punish bad behavior, try to incentivize good behavior because like and try to show people that like uh, there is like Bad, like usually when people have like toxic behavior online, it's because they don't see the the, the impact that's gonna make on the other people, right? Like they they they, they swear at someone online, and they they just think like I'm just swearing at the computer. No, like you're swearing at someone on the other side that's gonna receive that swearing at some way. Sometimes you just look at it ignore it, but like sometimes you can take that with the heart. Like just for some random people, take that with the heart, and it's gonna be like sad or something like that. And so like for sure, like try to incentivize good behavior but like most of the time just mute the person like because usually he's gonna like try to talk back with you and it's not gonna be work like it's just gonna be like that huge thing yeah. well thank Could you I have time to jump in on that one sure right so christian view... <laughs> all right keep it short <laughs> well, okay. I, do, I view toxicity and I, I view it coming from two sort of like fundamentally unique places one of them is the trolls on the internet and they're just looking for a rise. It's like a shock value. It's like they're searching for shock value. Those are the ones that are uh, easily ignored. It's literally just don't even don't even acknowledge their existence, right? Because you no know one's got time for that. But then there's the other there's the other side of toxicity that is more um, that is more like a, a negative disposition. Someone that's trying to be a to be a part of a community, but they are bending towards toxic or they're bending towards negativity, and they're doing it without meaning to they're not trying to be a troll they're just they're 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 getting angry quick and they're rushing to judgment quick and those are opportunities where i always view it as like if i'm at the grocery store and i'm like checking out with my stuff and um the guy or gal that's 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 ringing me up if i say how are you doing and they like grumble back and they're in a terrible mood i always view that as a moment where i can maybe shed some positivity into their life and just smile at them and say, I hope you're having an amazing day or like, you know, those little moments of positivity and don't let a negative disposition affect your disposition, especially if you're someone that is, has the camera on you because your platform is a lot stronger than you think. So don't let someone, someone's uh, toxicity or, or unintended toxicity or negativity affect you. You know what I mean? Like just be confident that um, that it's just them, they're having a bad day or they might be at a, at a bad time in their life and they might need um, a little bit of that positivity more more so than you think. And it's a good opportunity, not not to lecture, but to just impress a little bit of happiness and joy into someone's life. Um, that's how I, I, I've always viewed toxicity on the inter internet as coming from one of those two places. Yep. Well, thank you all for this insight. Thank you to Azuki, Alex, and Paulo, all three, for joining all our panel today. You guys were wonderful. And I'll turn it back over to Christian. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, thank so you much. very much. Thank you, guys.